everybody welcome today to the hot planet repair team's new monthly meeting previously our meetings have been every other week now we're deciding to do them at a monthly basis so we can get more covered on topic specific areas and the problems that we're addressing and the solutions that we're growing in order to address those problems the obvious one here is most of our community members would attest to is the problem of untrashing our home I'm going to begin us off here by starting to delve into what is the problem with untrashing our home. We have been living on Earth for a long time with many other organisms, and nature is home and just started just screaming at us saying, clean up your mess or else you're going to have to get out of here because you can't keep disrespecting the house and all your brothers and sisters that live in that house and have that same common ground to step on. That's going to be the topic today of what's the mess that we've created. The first problem is within our name of Hot Planet Repair Team, we got a hot planet, all right? That's what we gotta do. We gotta figure out how do we make it less hot and how do we take out all those different forms of trash? Because we realize in many different ways where we're going is not creating livable futures. And we do not wanna be going towards the Dante's Inferno of the future, the hell that we create. Let's instead create one that is a lot more fun, where home is a lot cleaner, and we could have a lot more fun partying, untrashing our home. That's the hot problem is the first one. The second one is the trash problem. Whether it's across Earth or outer space, we've trashed both of them. On our Earth, we got a bunch of land, air, and water, which we got untrash. We even have somebody on our team who's a strong advocate for untrashing our own bodies because we've been trashing our bodies a lot. So we'll hand that off to Allison later on. Yes, we have the hot planet. We have the trash planet. We also got another big problem, and that's the lazy river of life that humanity keeps floating down. We can't just keep being aimlessly going into this pathway lazily on what is not needed. We've created a lot of different mindsets and understanding on how the world works, how we perceive our reality, our lack of connection with other organisms and nature around us, when we really do understand that everything is about the interbeing of living life on Earth. And other life on Earth and the weather patterns is showing us isn't going to want us if we keep being the parasites that we've been for the past hundreds of years. How do we instead create a better relationship with nature to create growth and share balance and prosperity with nature alongside not humanity being separate from nature? We are part of nature through the different ways that we can untrash home and cool it. Let's make our planet cooler, not just temperature wise, but also in the way that we live. Let's be cooler to one another. Some of the other problems that we have listed here is uninformed, misled, untrusting of evidence-based science. We got nimbyism, not in my backyard. Well, we all got to really scale up the solutions that matter within our shared backyard. Can't be too lazy, self-centered, because greed leads to willful ignorance, arrogance, and division. We see division along many different parts of the world and the way that we divide ourselves apart from nature, but that's not the answer. So we got some problems there. The ways in which the trash is produced right now, the countries that produce the most plastic waste, this is just one form of trash we're looking at here. A lot of that kilograms per person can be higher in certain countries, while the mass output of trash on certain countries like the US, India, China, Brazil is the highest. This is a quick map we got there. I'm going to head it over to you, Tyler, to give us a little bit more of a background. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Great start. The old saying, you know, you can't fix what you don't measure. Well, we've been measuring it and measuring it in real time. If you go to the worldcounts.com, you'll see some of the challenges in the state of the planet. Very insightful knowledge being shared in real time. These are real time tickers that I took screenshots of yesterday. If you look at it, it looks like a national debt counter or something. It just going up, 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 up. If you look at tons of waste dumped this year so far, we're about 1.7 billion. It goes typically to 2 billion tons a year. And this is just tons of waste dumped into landfills. But if you look at the tons of solid waste across all waste streams, we're actually right here, it says we're at 9.3 billion so far this year uh, tons, but it's actually 11,000 tons a year. If you think about a total addressable market for untrashing, it's getting pretty ridiculous. But I've said this before, that this also represents the biggest opportunity in human history disguised as an existential crisis, because we've incentivized apathy with a lot of the subsidies provided to the oil and gas and the kind of take-make waste extractive economies. 
by shifting that to our circular regenerative one, we're really capitalizing on it. And this kind of brings it home with the half a trillion tons of virgin materials produced. Only 8.6% of that is actually circular being reintroduced into the economy. So if you think about it, that's a tremendous amount of room for improvement. If you're going for 100 and you only get 8.6, go back to the drawing board. <laughs> We have a lot of opportunity ahead of us here to untrash it and not only untrash it, but have a lot of results that can be reintroduced into an economy. I talk about this on large scale with different groups, talking about recycling 2,000 or 10,000 tons a day into the systems that actually behind me represent this recyclotron. That does 100 tons a day. But if you imagine 10,000 tons a day coming in, that's 10,000 tons a day going out. There's zero waste. So that's renewable materials being reintroduced into that local economy. So the impacts are immediate and dramatic for people, especially in developing countries and, and countries that need to seriously adjust the ways that they were just copying the laziness of how industrial nations were dealing with their trash, both into land, into water, and into the air. So rethinking trash, I'd like to hand it off to Alan on this one because he's got some great insights. Everything that I've been researching and working on for, well, the last 15 or 20 years says that everything that we produce can be recycled, including the radioactive waste if we work hard enough at it. Most of the waste is really pretty simple. It's made up of less than 20 atoms and maybe a few thousand molecule types. And I've been working on technologies that do carbonization and also take raw materials and break them down into their molecules. And that's typically sonification. And there's one other area of chemical conversion that I'm not actually involved in too much, but we can use the behavior patterns we recognize the greed and the laziness and all that stuff, we can actually use that when we prove that all these materials are actually cheaper to reintroduce into the circular economy because they've already been processed once. There's no extraction costs. There's almost unlimited reserves, especially in CO2. All we have to do is get through that paradigm shift. And it's not an easy lift because we're displacing highly entrenched trillion dollar invested businesses to do this kind of conversion and circularity. But it makes all the sense in the world. And if we can play on that greed, we'll be able to say, okay, hey, you can make more money recycling at the molecular level than you can at extracting. That's going to piss some people off, but that's okay. It'll definitely help the planet. I think it's a 100-year problem. I don't think it's going to be solved overnight, but the things we're working on are focused in exactly the right area. I can't put enough effort behind it. I have a thought, as Jonathan. One of the things that occurred to me is Newton's laws of energy. Energy is a constant. You can't create or destroy it. You can only transform it. That quote is probably not exact, but you get my drift. And that's the fundamentals of what we're doing here. Would, yeah. would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. In fact, it's really hard to get rid of carbon because <laughs> we're made out of it. It's just phase changing. So we're looking at waste streams in a different capacity of phase changing our waste streams in the waters, in the air, in the land, and phase changing that carbon pollution. I uh, just want to quickly touch into what are some of the vested interests that entrench old waste management systems? There's been a long history of how we manage our waste, our trash. In the end, we'll go into anecdotal parts of history that will be helpful for us to understand to help us go towards the direction that we need. But in the past, we've seen a mismanagement of our waste. And we've seen certain actors in politics and economics which hold on to waste systems as a way to keep making the money and other ways of just aggregating their way of ruling the waste systems. These unethical corporate or sometimes criminal groups, as you found in the history in Italy of their waste management systems, the history of the U.S. five boroughs and New Jersey doesn't have the greatest history as well in the way in which waste management systems are tied into corrupt criminal acts. You also find that in Uganda. Just look up for yourself the way in which corruption just keeps popping up across cases around the world for waste management. I would keep joking, but I'm kind of serious about this. If I had to do a PhD in the coming years, I would love to do it on the history of waste and how trash has really been one of the biggest issues that humanity has faced. Where I grew up, in Boston it used to be a bunch of different islands and then it was put together by extra trash. San Francisco did the same thing. Where I'm living now, Amsterdam is built on a bunch of trash. 
how did that trash get used into creating such big cities? How did those trash and the systems create diseases, as we'll find out in the case of London? How did it ruin our transit in the case of what they called the big crapple in the New York City? So we'll cover that later on in the presentation here. But It'll be interesting to see how did these entrenched older systems around waste management embrace the new, become part of the solution, or just keep remaining as part of the wasteful problem. It is part of the linear extractive economies that isn't focusing on long-termism and is instead focused on short-term gains to those who are not focusing on things like equitable distribution of wealth or scaling up the solutions that will solve climate change. We're going to move on now to one of the biggest forms of trash, which is heated up our planet. Who on our team would like to talk about why trash is in our air everywhere? Keep your hand, Tyler. I can just chime in here because I was capturing this from the world in data. This takes into account a number of years of accumulation from 1751 to 2017. So this is kind of a global picture. But if you could imagine just for North America, that's 457 billion tons of CO2 that have gone into the atmosphere. As a leader in trashing the planet, we have a certain obligation to get ahead of this problem, to lead us out of what we didn't know. I joke, we might have trashed our planet by accident. Imagine what we can do with it on purpose. So this looks at, and I showed the slides earlier talking about how much solid waste we're putting into the ground, but we're putting like 30 times more into the atmosphere. It's just invisible and we don't see it. So just because we can't see it, it's out of sight, it's out of mind. But if we have to start addressing waste, it has to be both visible and invisible waste and start converting it into renewable materials. When you start looking at how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, that's carbon, just like the carbon that we're mining out of the Earth's crust. But we have to shift from that Earth extracted carbon and shift into renewable carbon forms, both from our trash and waste streams, from all the carbon that we've pulled up, but also out of the atmosphere and creating biocarbon products and biocarbon economies. The United States has a currency backed by petroleum, which is a hydrocarbon. <laughs> so we know that a world currency can be backed by carbon and it's shown and it's doing quite well right now. Sorry for everyone else in the world that our currency is just skyrocketing at the detriment of developing countries because we have the world's reserve currency and it's a flight safety. And so we know that a currency can be backed by carbon. There's no reason why it can't be backed by, uh, by biocarbon. As far as the CO2 going on in the atmosphere, there's also other even more harmful emissions that have a shorter time in the atmosphere, but they're far more impactful in the short term. Methane being one of them, trying to figure out how to avoid keeping methane out of the atmosphere. And that's one of the things that we're doing in the untrashing is that we're taking that atmospheric waste as well as the landfills. And before they're releasing all that methane, we're processing it into renewable materials. It's a very good point that you're making, Tyler. Way too many people just have the carbon tunnel vision, right? Where they only focus on the carbon, but they need to understand it's also the methane out there. It's also the hydrofluorocarbons. And to pre-industrial levels, we have now two and a half times greater the level of methane now than we did about a couple hundred years ago. So I think a great framework for a lot of the work in climate action is, yes, we need mitigation and we need adaptation, but we also need climate restoration. We need to restore our climate to pre-industrial levels, whether it's the carbon, the methane, or the hydrofluorocarbons, which are coming from refrigerators and other sorts of cooling systems. So any way in which we can start looking at the, the trash of that air that we put into the atmosphere, whether it's carbon, methane, other ways like hydrofluorocarbons, how do you turn those into inputs where you can responsibly and durably store them in soils with things like biochar? Or do you want to instead inject that carbon into products and materials that you can utilize like concrete and cement or diamonds or fizzy drinks? We'll move on to the next area of trash. That's trash in our land. That's our most traditional way of looking at trash. This is a solid, tangible form where we see it way back in the day, we just toss it onto the streets in Amsterdam, actually, here. They used to use the canals. You know, everybody thinks those beautiful canals were great places you can maybe swim in. No, people tossed their trash in there for long periods of the time. And that became very unsustainable. It started to reek and people would not want to be out in the streets. 
they'd be tossing their waste around. Same thing would happen across U.S. cities. When I was talking about Boston and San Francisco and New York, a lot of them were smaller islands that were brought together by people just tossing out their trash around, building bigger landfills. But now we've got ourselves at a point where we have certain specific terms for our landfills. Like we have brown fields and we have other sorts of chemical waste places that are often around some of the most vulnerable communities. We really need to find ways that we can turn all of those municipal solid waste and town dumps into the more safer ecosystems out there, which can hopefully one day be flourishing biodiverse spots. Would anybody else like to mention anything about the trash that we find in our land? Maybe, Alan, you have a better perspective on the different inputs that we find in our land. Is it X amount plastic that we're finding? What kind of metals are coming about? Anyone have any more details they like to toss out around the land? Well, the, the big thing are the PFAs, PFOs, the permanent chemicals. What we've done in corporate agriculture or modern agriculture is really trashed a lot of stuff. And we have a lot of hidden waste caches, especially in developed countries for agricultural waste, where landfills won't even take it and the burying it on their property. Well, all the plastics that are used for irrigation, the plastics are used for mulching and on planting the plants. Those things are a real serious problem. They're just hidden because people are so lazy not to deal with it. We have certain regulations that are around liability and protecting revenue streams and things like that. Hot Plant Repair Team is leading the point here. We just have to understand that we're driving change and change isn't necessarily appreciated. It's uncomfortable for people. We just need to be aware that we're going to get ambushed all over the place for some of this thinking and the projects we're taking on, but somebody's got to do it and we're on point. That's all I really have to say about that. Thank you very much, Alan. And Jeremy, please go ahead and reflect on how to untrash our land. Yeah, unfortunately, I've got a lot of job security for this. I've actually been talking to, to Tyler a lot, so I'm excited as a future, but it's directly dealing with super funds and brownfield sites. Coming back from South America, they're not even doing soil samples. So this is something where a lot of countries are really behind the ball in understanding it. So I'm really hoping that we can find ways to support them because they don't really even understand the problem yet. And a lot of them, it's more complex than just cleaning it up. But that's something where there's more potential for the cleanups. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, just love the work that you've been doing for years now and focusing all of the trash we put in our soils. And how do we, instead of keep degrading our soils, diminishing them, restoring them, helping them grow again, like many of our founding fathers wanted to in the US or other countries around the world that have realized that their soil health is their health. So anyways, that community members like yourself can add additional points of value for mapping out the issues and then how do you share the knowledge, experience, and then growing in projects that can restore those trash deep. Right. Yeah, we're, we're finally starting to get data back from Ecuador from the soil samples we took. We've got like extremely high levels of cadmium and arsenic and copper in organic farms that have never applied fertilizers and pesticides. That's beyond just what the European Union is seeing with those types of contaminants in their fertilizers and pesticides. So there's a whole lot of leaching capacity because of the microclimates and altitude. So trying to dig deeper and understand these relationships is going to be, fortunately, more complex than I originally thought it would just be like, here's a pile of trash. So those relationships are intertwining into the waterways and other neighboring countries, even to where it's like, I haven't quite figured out a positive spin on how to create the sense of urgency for the people of understanding in terms of common people like my parents of this is actually something that should be discussed more. They've acknowledged it's a problem, but they haven't really what I would consider accepting it. any data that I can provide to help with that story. I'm a researcher, I'm not a storyteller. Happy to provide whatever's needed because I'm finding more and more every day, it seems. Jeremy, what I usually try and do is, because my dad would be the same, is I, I bring it back to, you know, because people think it's not affecting them. And I always say, if it's in the land and it's in the water and it's in the air, it's in you. Yeah. Just no other option. So what it comes down to is, is if you're worried about yourself, you should be worried about this. And there's PFAS in even the rainwater around the world. Oh, look at the study. There was a study that said 83% of fresh waterways in the U.S. are contaminated with PFAs, yeah. which I think is low. I think it's um, low, too. <laughs> with all my numbers. Yeah, they're making it more aware. And it's like my parents are older and they're like, I'm going to die anyways. Like they've kind of reached that point where they're just, it is what it is. Like they've accepted other things. 
the really poor communities that I visited in South America, they have so many other problems that mm -hmm. pertain to like the immediacy of their lives that it's like they don't understand how the impacts are forcing their children's lives, like growing soy in these fields and all these things that they're doing are the problems are actually caused by the economic solutions that they're seeking. There's a lot of pieces of complexities that are playing roles in these third world countries that I think my hope is that we can use those opportunities in those places to really shift the paradigms of their existences and say, okay, we made this small change. It changed this many people's lives, but there's that scalability that industrial nations need where they want to see that model first. I'm planning on going back, I think, in uh, mid-January, but I'm waiting to hear from the universities there about more of these water and soil samples because their water is unpotable, but they can't tell me why. Like even the Ministry of Agriculture can't tell me why. They just say, don't drink it. I'm eager to see what contaminants are in the water that it's universally accepted not to drink the water because it's not just diseases. I'll Jeremy, thank you very much for giving your boots in the field experience within the academics and, and those projects that you're seeing across North and South America and how they're related to our trashed land. Everyone needs to be waking up to these issues and then going straight towards the solutions. People like your parents, like my family also, who still doesn't really focus on this as well, tell them that they can do their own part by buying better meat or other foods that are produced with a lot more space for their livestock, uh, for their chicken, or maybe in their own backyard, something that they can do to restore their soils is by things like compost. So there's a lot of different things we'll focus on. What can individuals do? But what we want to talk about is scale here and some of the other issues that we're finding within trash. And that is, yes, often when it runs off your soils, it runs into your waterways. It runs into your rivers. We are seeing this not only in our riverways across North America, but also within our oceans. There's now two giant masses of plastic and other trash picking up in two areas of the Pacific. They're like two big vortexes of just one big ball of plastic. Tyler, do you have anything you'd like to share on your knowledge of trash and water? Yeah, well, it's kind of sad because of all of those plastic gyres of garbage, there's 30 times more waste at the bottom than there is at the top. So it's a challenge that we got to get it before it gets out there. And it's great that we've got some efforts to clean up those garbage patches, but we've got to get it out of there before it gets there. And that's a big problem. And then right now I captured that so far this year, we've dumped 10.6 million tons of plastic into the ocean. We've got our work cut out for us. And just like Jeremy said, you know, you want job security, be a janitor without borders. <laughs> In any case, yeah, that's it's just a huge crisis, but this is valuable material. And if you can break it down, as Alan was talking about, it does create a shift and we can all have a collaborative intention to untrash the planet. And those PFOSs, those are forever chemicals that are getting into our water and into our rain. That's a problem that's going to be challenging our lifespans and our quality of life because we're going to be seeing other types of health issues earlier in life. And we're not going to know where they're coming from. Just like Jeremy's saying, we don't know what's wrong with the water, but just don't drink it. I have an interesting story from there. I grew up in uh, north of Boston and there's a famous movie, a really great movie about a, a tenacious lawyer called A Civil Action. And A Civil Action takes place around the rivalry town that I grew up from, Woburn. They had these tanning factories where when they would tan leather and clothes, they dumped their water into the river that I grew up swimming in, down the river from Woburn. And there was a famous movie in 1998 where they talk about all the people that were really dangerously harmed in ecosystems from pouring their waste into the water. It's one of the most famous cases in the EPA in the U.S. This is now happening at a scale across the world, and people need to stand up for untrashing their water. People need to be held liable and accountable for what they're doing to our waterways because we are walking bags of water as humans. I forget, is it around 80% of our body is H2O? It's very obvious that, as it shows here too, plastics are showing up in our snow and rain. We have whales that are swallowing 10 million pieces of microplastic each day. There, there are major side effects and issues that we're finding here, like algae too. But Allison has made the point, and I'm going to say it again before, as she, she wrote down here, you know, you've got all these forms of trash like nitrates, sulfites, sulfates, ammonia, but if it's in the water, land, and air, and animals, then it's in you too. So let's try and untrash ourselves and everything around us. We're going to move on just for time's sake here. 
Trash in space is another place that we got to be concerned about. I got a friend who used to work at the European Space Agency. Now he's over in Stanford in the US and his job is to focus on all the satellite trash that keeps hitting each other in space. There's tons of money that needs to go across international and national space agency efforts just to take care of the amount of dangerous waste that is now flying around outside Earth and is become a real issue. This stuff not only affects the other satellites and things that we have running our digital worlds, but even sea turtles. Sea turtles think that some of these different things up in the sky are the moon, so they start going the wrong way. You have animals getting lost because of the trash that we're putting in space outside of our home and place that is Earth. I mean, come on, seriously, humans. We've been to the moon and back, but we can't stop trashing everything on our Earth and our space. Moving on to one quote I wanted to share here is the secret of change is to focus all the energy, not fighting the old. We're not going to go fight those corrupt waste management system folk and the systems, but we got to build the new ones. We got to build the new ones that are going to be solving our waste problems by not being linear and extractive anymore, but being circular and regenerative. The two cases I wanted to quickly close off with today is historical perspectives for future action. Manhattan and many other big cities around the world, like London, and even if you go back to ancient Rome, Julius Caesar got rid of horse tracks because there was so much pollution, shit that was going out into the streets and traffic that was being caused there. They had to diminish the amount of things that were going on there. And in New York, there was so much manure just going all over the streets. People wouldn't even want to be outside. It was so stinky. It piled up to such a crazy extent. They started calling it the Big Crapple. No, I'm not sure if they called it the Big Crapple back then, but that's how they refer to it now. And it's an interesting story and in actually how some of these issues that came up with old forms of transportation inspired new forms of transportation. So innovation can come from our pollution issues. Once humans get so fed up with their own mess, they can innovate to an extent that is really creative and efficient. So let's do the same thing now with the different technologies and human normative behaviors that we can really focus on to clean up our mess. Another great one that I'd like to focus on is the history of the Thames River in London. London was the biggest city in the world at the time. And in the 1800s, the trash started becoming such a bad issue that people were just avoiding the Thames. They were tossing all of their different forms of waste and sewage into the river. At one point, the parliament right next to where now Big Ben is got remodeled and moved right next to the Thames. But then they had one of the biggest stinks of all time, the Great Stink of 1858, where they were like, we can't even talk to each other because it smells so bad right now. And so with all these issues of poor usage of waste, it caused cholera, some of the biggest cholera outbreaks ever. Jon Snow, not the one from Game of Thrones, <laughs> he said, actually, that this stink and problems is not coming from our air. It's coming from what we drink. Our own water that we drink is our waste. That's causing cholera, one of the worst diseases. So they created a modern systems and civic infrastructure to manage their waste systems on right near the, the Bank of London. And also in Amsterdam, they had their own ways to figure it out and stop throwing trash in the middle of the canals. So how can we make sure that we don't repeat these mistakes of previous waste issues that humanity has had in the past and really instead restore our ecosystems? This one quote, I think is really powerful. This is related to waste is when we must pay the true price for the depletion of nature's gifts, materials will become more precious to us and economic logic will reinforce and not contradict our heart's desire to treat the world with reverence and when we receive nature's gifts to use them well. Let's use our waste. Let's not think of waste just as waste. Make it an input. Let's become a green, clean, recycling machine. <laughs> that was awesome, Jake. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. I love it.